So he basically doubled down on his misreading of the paper that he cited. Amazing. So he completely misread that part of the report. We are literally less than one minute into this video. And what I've learned has already misrepresented a claim about protein from this report. Hey, what is going on guys? So today we have a huge debunk of the recent What I've Learned video, which was based on plant protein and animal protein and how, you know, plant protein isn't as quality as animal protein and all that good stuff. This video might be broken up into two parts. I'm not really sure at the point in time in which I'm filming this, but yeah, there's a lot of claims made and a lot of data that has to be gone into in order to refute these claims. Let's get right into it. Protein is not protein. For example, did you know that 30 grams of protein from one food could build less muscle than 30 grams of protein from another food? Or in a person who requires a minimum of 50 grams of protein a day for healthy body function, 50 grams of protein from this would not actually meet their protein needs. Okay, so we are already 30 seconds into the video and there was already a load of nonsense to unpack. So throughout much of this video, we're going to see what I've learned using the DIAS system for scoring amino acids in terms of digestibility. DIAS stands for Digestible Indispensable Amino Acid Score. And to be honest, there are so many issues that come with trying to use this kind of scoring system when evaluating plant proteins. So like I said, I'm not sure if this video is going to be a part one or a part two or just one giant video, but if this is a part one, we're probably gonna spend the majority of it covering the DIAS system and just how bad it is because he uses it in the majority of this video and it'll save us a lot of time long-term when refuting his claims. And if it wasn't clear, I'm going to be referring to the digestible and dispensable amino acid score as DIAS, just to be simple because we're gonna be using the phrase a lot in this video. So what is the DIAS scoring system? Essentially, it's a scoring system used to assess just how digestible proteins are in specific foods that are traditionally high in protein or just foods in general. The FAO has endorsed the DIAS system to replace the previous way of determining protein digestibility known as Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score or PDCAAS. Although the DIAS scoring system is superior to the PDCAAS system, there are a number of limitations, many of which apply to the context of plant-based dietary patterns. I'm going to name around five limitations and then elaborate on them a little later. So number one, there is a failure to translate differences in nitrogen to protein conversion factors between plant and animal-based foods. Number two, there is limited representation of commonly consumed plant-based foods within the scoring framework. Number three, the formulation of the DIAS system is centered on fast-growing animal models rather than humans. Number four, in the scoring system, there was a focus on isolated foods rather than a food matrix. And number five, the DIAS uses raw plant foods rather than cooked plant foods. After watching this video, you will fully understand why the DIAS scoring system really should not be used in the context of assessing plant-based proteins. So let's start with the first limitation. The DIAS system fails to translate differences between nitrogen to protein conversion factors between plants and animal foods. So what does this mean? Well, within the amino acid scoring system that preceded the DIAS system, the PDCAAS system, nitrogen content of food was used to estimate the protein content of food. And this made sense considering food specific nitrogen to protein conversion factors have been determined for various foods and can be used for calculating the protein content of food. But in the case of the DIAS scoring system, the FAO does not use food specific nitrogen to protein conversion factors, but instead a generalized nitrogen to protein conversion factor. This generalized factor is set at 6.25 and is used because it was originally estimated that all proteins contain 16% nitrogen, but we now know this is not the case and that nitrogen content varies greatly between proteins. So the problem with using a generalized nitrogen to protein conversion factor is that in doing so, you fail to take into account each individual food's nitrogen to protein conversion factor. This will influence a food's DIAS score. As an example, the nitrogen food specific factors for almonds and soybeans are 5.20 and 5.61. As a result, using the generalized factor or 6.25 to calculate their DIAS yields 16.8% and 10.2% lower values than would be calculated based on their food specific factors. And this could work the other way around for animal foods. The food specific nitrogen conversion factors for skim milk and yogurt are 6.36 and 6.40. Using the generalized conversion factor of 6.25, 
actually results in a higher dias than would be calculated using 6.36 or 6.40. And there are other examples of discrepancies between conversion factors for plant foods and animal foods. The point here is that this methodology of using a generalized conversion factor influences the dias scores for both plant and animal foods, decreasing scores for plant-based sources of protein while increasing scores for animal-based sources of protein. Okay, so let's move on to number two. Number two is that there is a limited representation of commonly consumed plant foods within the dias scoring framework. For this one, I will be reading straight from this paper that articulates this issue very well. Previous research on dietary protein digestibility based on dias and athletes consuming plant-based diets has excluded the contributions made by fruits and vegetables. Here is some of that research. The omission of these food groups skews analyses for those following plant-based dietary patterns as they consume a greater amount of total calories from both fruits and vegetables than non-vegetarians. While protein intake is relatively low in these food groups, their sum contributes to the total amount of digestible protein consumed per day. Furthermore, vegetarians consume more legumes, including soy foods, meat analogs, nuts, seeds, and whole grains, than non-vegetarians. These foods tend to be poorly represented in the dias calculation spreadsheet, further underestimating the true protein digestibility in those following a plant-based dietary pattern. The third limitation of the dias scoring system is the formulation of the dias scoring system being based on fast-growing animals rather than humans. The FAO recommends that dias should be determined in humans where possible. The problem is that ileal digestibility can only be assessed in humans when equipped with nasal ileal tubes or following ileostomy surgery. This makes data on humans very limited and has made animal models be used for the majority of dias modeling. The FAO recommends that tests be performed in growing pigs followed by growing rats when human data are not available. There is an issue here. Although the digestion of protein between the mouth and ileum is thought to be similar in pigs and humans, there are still important digestive and metabolic differences between rats and humans. The lack of comparative studies in pigs, rats, and humans indicates that applying current dias data to humans should be performed with caution. In the case of comparing fast-growing rats and pigs to humans, sensible interspecies comparisons are difficult to make. This is because the amino acid requirements in fast-growing animals like rats and pigs are predominantly directed toward tissue growth, whereas requirements in humans older than one year are used largely for maintenance. Now, the second to last limitation I wanna go over is how the dias scoring system focuses on specific foods rather than food matrices. The dias system largely focuses on single ingredient meals and doesn't take into account the complex nutritional interactions that can occur within mixed meals or a food matrix. And this is important to consider, especially when talking about plant-based dietary patterns, considering how diverse plant-based diets can be. Here are some examples straight from this paper. In humans, increasing branch chain amino acids found ubiquitously in meat and animal products decreases phenylalanine and tryptophan uptake. The protein sparing effects of carbohydrates, which has been established for over a century, in addition to epidemiological studies, consistently indicates higher relative intakes of carbohydrates in plant-based populations. And this could also influence IAA requirements and dias accuracy. This scoring method, however, fails to consider such nutritional interactions. The paucity of dias values for fruits, vegetables, and mixed plant-based meals suggests that scores for individual foods may provide a skewed picture of actual amino acid availability in vivo. Mariotti and Gardner acknowledge these issues, noting that dias were erroneous when using individual isolated plant proteins, as in developed countries, an array of plant-based proteins are typically consumed in a single meal and tend to greatly exceed requirements. I've shared this data before, but here are more accurate accounts of protein digestibility between animal and plant proteins. And to be clear, this data is much more precise considering it uses real oral ileal nitrogen digestibility in humans. Soy protein isolate, pea protein isolate, pea protein flour, wheat flour, and lupin flour exhibit 89 to 92% digestibility, whereas eggs, meat, and milk proteins exhibit 90 to 95% digestibility. And the last use of the dias scoring system that I want to cover is its use of raw plant food as opposed to cooked plant food. The issue here is that protein-rich plant foods, such as legumes and grains, typically undergo heat treatment, processing, or both before consumption. This is important to note because we know that common cooking techniques modify proteins with heat-treated plant-based proteins demonstrating higher digestibility compared with unprocessed sources. All right, so now that we've fully demolished the use of the dias scoring system in the context of plant-based proteins, which is primarily what, what I've learned had done in his video, the criticizing of the rest of his video shouldn't be 
too difficult. Let's get back to his video. This is important because the body requires protein for all kinds of things to stay healthy, anything from building bones to making hormones. And data from NHANES suggests that 40% of Americans aren't even hitting their minimum protein requirements. All right, so I was a little bit confused at this part where he was saying that 40% of Americans aren't hitting their minimum protein requirement. I mean, this would mean that literally 40% of Americans are protein deficient. So I went over to the transcript for the video where what I've learned posts all of his sources, and I found that he was citing a 2015 USDA report on dietary guidelines. I tried to find out where this 40% figure was and found this part of the report that said, nearly 60% of the US population meets the protein foods intake recommendation. But then it said in the next sentence, although some groups in the US population do not consume recommended amounts of protein food groups, Intakes of protein as grams per day are adequate across the population and protein is not a shortfall nutrient. So he completely misread that part of the report. What I've learned read that 60% of the US population meets the protein foods intake recommendation and determined from this that 40% are not meeting their recommended daily amount of protein per day. But how could this be the case if in literally the next sentence it says, although some groups in the US population do not consume recommended amounts from the protein foods group, Intakes of protein as grams per day are adequate across the population and protein is not a shortfall nutrient. Well, that's because the 60% statistic wasn't about grams of protein consumed per day. It was about the percentage of people who meet the recommendations for specific foods that are considered as protein foods. These foods are defined in the report as meat, poultry, fish, seafood, eggs, soy, nuts, and seeds. This is even showcased in a chart. So we are literally less than one minute into this video, and what I've learned has already misrepresented a claim about protein from this report. This is why channels like this are so problematic. This video has nearly 413,000 views at the time that I'm filming this, and most likely most of the viewers made it to at least one minute in and heard him misrepresent this fact. Let this be a reminder to fact check the people who make videos like this, and that includes me. So shortly after this, he goes over some plant protein values and animal protein values using the dyad scoring system, which we've already established is not too good of an idea when comparing plant protein to animal protein. He then goes on to say this. But here's something you might find surprising. 50 grams of protein per day is the minimum protein requirement for adults. And if you look here, most of these 103 countries get most of their protein from plants and they're hitting their 50 grams a day just fine. But plant proteins aren't digested as well. So if you incorporate the digestibility of the proteins, far more countries are just under the 50 gram requirement. So a couple things. Number one, he again didn't even read the study properly. He said the study went over 103 countries when in reality, it was also territories that were being looked at. 103 countries, 103 countries. Also, if you look at the paper, they determined that the populations were getting enough protein, but then weren't once applying the DIAS scoring system to protein intake, which again, we've already established is not a good metric when it comes to analyzing plant protein. You're gonna hear me say that phrase many times in this video. Especially considering another March 2021 study looking at 187 Polish children found that children not eating meat, a high quality protein, were three centimeters shorter and had weaker bones. All right, so I'm sure many of you saw this study on Polish children go around indicating that vegan children on average were shorter than non-vegan children. I'm just going to link a video Dr. Avi posted on his channel covering this paper and other things in depth to shorten the length of my video. His video was super in depth and over an hour, so if you have the time, definitely go ahead and watch it. I'll link it in the caption. And if you don't feel like doing that, long story short, no pun intended, the difference in height was neither statistically or clinically significant between the groups. And after things like BMI are accounted for, which they weren't in the paper when assessing differences in bone mineral density, the difference in bone mineral density between groups is not substantial. This is because differences in BMI can actually cause differences in bone mineral density. Generally, heavier people tend to have more bone mineral density because your bones will be bearing more weight when you're heavier, making higher bone mineral density more preferable. Soy and pea protein powders do have a decent amount of well-digested amino acids, but still to match the leucine content and essential amino acid content of 25 grams of whey protein, you need 40 grams of soy protein or 38 grams of pea protein. So the implication here is that in order for a vegan to get the same benefits for muscle and strength building as somebody consuming 25 grams of whey protein, they would need to fully match their leucine intake from vegan sources of protein and have even more protein intake because some vegan sources of protein are not too high in leucine. But this just isn't true. Here is a 2020 randomized control trial showing that at 1.6 grams per kilogram of protein consumed per day, with 10 grams of leucine per day, 
Additional leucine beyond 10 grams is not shown to further increase muscle growth or strength in resistance trained individuals. In other words, as long as a vegan athlete is consuming a generally high amount of protein anyway, they do not need to go above and beyond for leucine in the interest of gaining muscle and strength. This protein quality issue may be why this study found that women not eating meat have less muscle mass than women who do eat meat, even though they ate the same total grams of protein. So what I've learned cites a cross-sectional paper going over how women who consumed animal protein had more muscle mass than women who consumed plant protein. Cross-sectional papers have a strong limitation in that the temporal link between the outcome and the exposure cannot be determined because both are examined at the same time. These kinds of papers show differences, but not necessarily true changes. Here is a much stronger paper titled High Protein Plant-Based Diets versus a Protein-Matched Omnivorous Diet to Support Resistance Training Adaptations, a Comparison Between Habitual Vegans and Omnivores. The conclusion of this paper, after controlling for protein intake, was that the source of protein did not matter in supporting muscle strength and mass accrual. So for the next two minutes, he goes on to make the same ridiculous claims about vegans needing to eat more protein to meet their daily requirement because of his, again, erroneous use of the dias system in assessing plant sources of protein. So we're just gonna skip that. But it was surprising to me that even these athletes, who I imagine would be very calculated with their protein, could be missing their recommended protein intake. With the right knowledge and diligence, yes, you can meet your protein requirements on a vegetarian or vegan diet, but you need to make sure to pick the right proteins. He's making it sound like, oh, it is just more difficult to be a vegan athlete because you have to choose the right proteins. And of course, he only thinks this because he is still functioning off of the diet scoring system. I'm not going to repeat myself. And of course, we know this is just not true given the bioavailability we know of plant proteins from much more precise tests. And are you surprised? As we move forward in the video, he's making more comparisons between plant and animal sources of protein using the diet system. Aren't you glad I covered this at the beginning of this debunk? He then goes on to play a clip of Lane Norton to support the leucine stuff, which we've already covered with this paper. All right, so I'm going to be skipping to the end because the rest is a lot of just the same shit. If we go to the end, we'll see that he mentions that 40% of Americans aren't getting enough protein protein statistic, which we've already established wasn't even about daily protein intake, but instead intake of foods categorized as protein foods. So he basically doubled down on his misreading of the paper that he cited. Amazing. All right, guys, that is the end of the video. I don't know, again, if this is two videos or if this is one video. Once I finish editing everything, we'll see if I decide to make this a one video response or two. In the past, you guys have, you know, said that one video tends to be better. So I'll probably end up doing that. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Doing this video required a lot of research and a lot of time. So if you want to support me on Patreon and help make things like this more possible, the link is in my description. And if you want to become a YouTube member and make use of some of those amazing ex-vegan, anti-vegan emojis I have, please consider joining. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Dude, even vegans don't get your weird, stupid wannabe sense of irony here. W who is your audience? Nobody gets these dumb jokes. Dude, even vegans don't get your weird, stupid...